Welcome to the New York State Museum. Uh, my name's Jennifer Lamack. I'm the Chief Curator of History. And I am so pleased that we are here and our speaker's here. So um, this building opened on July 4th, 1976, and Adirondack Hall was the first uh, set of exhibits to open. Um, over the next few years, staff worked to open the east side of the museum, which is known as Metropolis Hall. And within um, Metropolis Hall is Tuck High, and a little bit about what we're gonna talk about. So in 1980, museum staff learned that the Tuck High Company store, which was one of the longest running stores in Manhattan's Chinatown, was going to close, and it was located at 24 Mott Street, uh, was closing due to dramatically rising rent costs. So the museum was able to purchase the store from the Lee family, uh, who had been running it since 1890. And they purchased uh, the store inventory, they purchased some of the architectural elements of the store, they purchased the cash register, pretty much everything, about 2,000 items total. Um, and then they also purchased uh, inventory from two other Chinatown stores uh, located at 55 Mott Street and 38 Mott Street. So the Chinatown collections in, the, in our in our museum's collection run about 3,000, um, and it runs, runs the gamut. Um, so our Tuck High store, which you see on the screen, is interpreted as the store it was in um, 1935. Um, and every few years, the Lee family visits the store, and we heard tonight that it still, when they go in, it still smells like they remember it when it was in Chinatown, which I think is very, very cool. Um, so my colleague Ashley Hopkins, Benton, and I are working to update the 40-year-old exhibit. The exhibit went up around 1982 um, with the rest of the Eastside Museum. And we are working to update it with new information um, and bring it up to date a little bit over the past 40 years. And we're also thinking about including um, history from other Chinatown communities in New York State. So our speaker this evening, Jack Chen, was already busy working on working to document Chinatown's community history when the museum acquired the Tuck High store in 1980. Jack Chen is a historian, curator, dumpster diver, and teacher surfacing the disappeared stories othered by systems of power and wealth. Dr. Chen is the Clement A. Price Professor of Public History and Humanities and Director of the Price Institute on Ethnicity, Cultures, and the Modern Experience at Rutgers at the Newark campus. He is the founding director of the Asian Pacific America Studies Program and Institute at New York University, and he has co-founded the Museum of Chinese in America. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Chen. Good evening, everybody. It's really wonderful to be here. Um, I would love to just start out by asking you all a question. Now, some of you are a little younger, so you may not, you'll have different answers, but I can see there are some people who are my age or older um, here. And um, well, first of all, I should say, I'm really happy that the Lee family um, descendants are here. So really welcome and, um, you know, it's, it's really, I mean, in some ways you should be up here telling a story. So maybe we can ask you to come up and say a few things. Is that possible? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll ask a little bit later. <laughs> so, um, but really it's, you know, when we started the New York Chinatown History Project um, in 1979, 1980, it was a moment in which uh, dumpsters began appearing, and you may remember this, on Chatham Square and also on Lower Mott Street. And uh, that's really, so I was literally going into these dumpsters um, and, uh, fortunately, the museum was able to purchase uh, the contents of this store, uh, which is really quite remarkable. Uh, but there are many other stores like this on Lower Mott Street, uh, Doyers, uh, Pell Street, that um, really were just tossed out, including on um, basically the, the Bowery and, and Chatham Square. Uh, so in 1979, 1980, a lot of the stores that were on Chatham Square had a lease of 99 years, 99 years. And the dumpsters started appearing because the leases had expired. 
And you can just imagine from a real estate point of view that, oh, you know, they're just eager to get in there, you know, because these leases were, you know, quite stable. And uh, from the point of view of New York, they weren't um, making that much money from these, the valuable property. But I think it really kept um, really a feeling of the way uh, old New York, not just Chinatown, but old New York was really kept in place by, by these leases because the stability of the leases enabled these stores, uh, and they were not just Chinese stores, to really continually operate. Uh, for a long time, and to uh, you know, Olaf's the oldest uh, ongoing pharmacy store. I don't know if you remember Olaf's um, pharmacy, which is not Chinese, but it was on Chatham Square, and uh, they one day basically were emptying out their stuff, you know, and um, being thrown into a dumpster. So we just started going into these dumpsters, talking to some of the owners of the stores to see if we could. Uh, really retrieve some of these things that would have otherwise ended up in the Staten Island kills. You know, they would just been dumped. Um, so this question of what's valued and what's valuable in terms of the past and what's not, what's just thrown out, uh, is a fundamental question. And um, it's a question about archives. It's a question about museum collections. Uh, what's considered valuable? So we, you know, there are no New York City museums that were collecting this material were not, Chinatown was not considered really that significant in that way, in the same way that uh, other famous men, um, and we, you know, we kind of, we can reconstruct who these men were, um, what their diaries were, they, their materials or the famous artists would be kept to the minutia where, where they would be gone through, but whole communities um, that were really so much a part of New York City were generally not necessarily preserved. The, the stores, nor the papers, nor the, the books, the accounting books. Um, and that, that was really just at the time in which what's called the new social history was being, um, was kind of emerging on campuses in which oral histories, oral histories of women, for example, women's history was really just emerging at the time. And the history of uh, various, uh, minoritized groups, groups that were racialized, um, and I'll talk about the Chinese in a minute, but Italians, you know, that history was really not being acknowledged. The Irish history is not. So all of this was just emerging in the, in really coming out of the civil rights movement in the 70s, and people were beginning to do the new social history. And the new social history meant that it was not necessarily the, the items from a famous person, but oftentimes from stores, also, oftentimes from uh, workers who were just really quite humble in their occupation. And it was not thought that those histories and those stories were that important until this moment that began to kind of uh, really uh, prompt um, lots of people to start valuing that history, from community organizations, community historical societies, to also graduate students. And, um, and so we really were able to bring together a group of young um, recently graduated students uh, who were interested in really documenting what this history of Chinatown was about and began uh, this effort to try to document and speak to people. Um, but before I get into that, I'd love to just hear um, what are the associations that people have with Chinatown? Um, and it could be anything, and I just want to invite you to just kind of say anything that comes to your mind, because that's really part of the point. So what are the associations people may have? It could be of New York, of course. I don't know how many of you are New Yorkers and uh, have been in New York State for a long time, but if you're coming from somewhere else in the country, you probably have some as association with another Chinatown, perhaps San Francisco or Los Angeles or Chicago or some other place. But just I'd love to hear what some of these associations might be. So just, um, uh, yeah, could I mean, we could... Restaurants, okay, what kind of restaurants are you thinking of? Chinese restaurants, but what, I mean, what would you imagine these restaurants to look like? Not like anything I had seen in any other place. Okay. I mean, and, it, and I noticed that, you know, the tourists weren't eating there. You notice who? The that tourists were eating. Were not eating there. No. So there were Chinese people eating there, yeah. Almost exclusively in the 70s when I first started going. Okay, and where was the restaurant? Where? Uh, were there, was there a favorite restaurant you went to? No, 
and I are about the same age. We grew up about the, you know, at the beginning of this, you know, in, inspired by roots and maybe, you know, history from the bottom up. Yeah. The other ninety eight percent. Yeah. And uh, no, it was just, and I was just thrilled. And this, this, this came no notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, restaurants, uh, neon signs, New York. I mean, what are what are some of the other associations that people have? I'd love to I'd love to just start picking on people because I know you have some association. I'd love to just hear you know what you're thinking of. Yeah, go ahead. Not a lot in English. Not a lot in English. So you'd walk around the streets, you'd hear Chinese of some not kind. Not that, but all of the signs. All the signs were not. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, a whole lot of red too. Red, okay. Do you know red why? Gold, no. Red is good luck, you know. Yeah, uh huh. Red signs, especially. Um, uh, and what what kind of culture do you come from? Do you have immigrant uh, ancestors somewhere back there? No, um, Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. Okay, okay. So in terms of language, so how far back was? Uh, you know, did your family come way back before? They moved to, to New York in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. Okay. So did you grow up with some Puerto Rican? Yeah. Okay. So in some ways, being a different language must have, I mean, so in some ways, being in different neighborhoods in New York was not so strange to hear different languages in that way. No. Okay. Okay. But, okay, and how about food or restaurants, things like that? I didn't go to any. Okay, you didn't go. <laughs> you, oh, you were too scared. Okay, yeah, I think a lot of people feel intimidated from just like going through that door, right? I've also been in Flushing too. Yeah. Which is which now is like unbelievable. Yeah. It's it's like almost like being in a different country. Right. Yeah. Some some of the restaurants were like a floor down below street. Like right. Basement. Take the stairs down. There right. And go in for. Yeah, you know, and that was common in 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 old New York. Uh, but in some ways, I think we kind of lost that understanding. And I think so many of the downtown stores and communities were so, you know, like dug up, renovated. Uh, so in some ways, Chinatown and Little Italy were kind of the remnants of that old New York. Although people go there and think of it, oh, that's Chinatown or that's Little Italy. But in fact, they were, they were keeping the feeling of old New York, kind of like the way this little street front does. Um, in a way that we just don't have anymore. I mean, still bits and pieces of Mott Street, but the scale of things were kind of lower scale. Yeah. So, any other associations that people are thinking of? Yeah. Groceries. Groceries. Yeah. Stores, a lot of groceries, large volumes. Yeah. Are you thinking of the outdoor market as well? I mean, outdoor displays of food, or are you just talking about going into the groceries? Into the grocery. You know, very large bags of rice, et cetera. Yeah. Right. Who, who eats a 100-pound bag of rice, right? <laughs> when you go to the supermarket, it's like, what, 5-pound, 20-pound bag at the most, right? But yeah. Um, so that contrast of, of different things. Anything else? OK, um, how about films, uh, movies, associations that people may have from that? Um, I'm really curious if, you know, uh, Songs, those kinds of associations that people may have. Uh, TV shows that people may have. I mean, so because we're not, I mean, this is a very polite audience, but we know that a lot of these associations oftentimes were not so polite uh, in terms of kind of a mysterious Chinatown, uh, murders happening in Chinatown. Um, you know, I mean, you know, in terms of the mainstream commercial culture, and how it represents Chinatown, there's a lot of that kind of stuff um, that's there. Uh, anything that comes to your mind in that, in that way? The representations in film only, they seem kind of unidimensional. Okay, well, you're being very polite. Just go, go for it. Just say what they are. It's, it seems like well, the assumption was that every you know, Asian person knew Kung Fu or, or were involved in some sort of criminal enterprise right. was not very polite. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Italians don't fare very well either, right? So, well, they were right next door. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Italians and Chinese, right? Yeah. Um, anything else? Uh, some of the films that, I mean, um, 
I'm old enough to have watched um, some of the Saturday afternoon films that were kind of reruns and uh, of 20s and 30s films. I don't know if any of you can. Turner Classic Movies. Turner Classic Movies, okay. Recently, uh, this, this last month, they have this thing about defamation. Yeah. And, uh, you know, finding appropriate actors to portray. And, and the stories are all, of course, ridiculous. And it's just so, so stereotypical. But we all grew up with that. White people grew up with that. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, and everybody had a fake Chinese accent. Right. Which is just, it's almost like speaking, you know, pigeon black now. Yeah, so, um, uh, Charlie Chan, okay, yeah. Charlie Chan played by a number of non-Chinese actors, Warner Olin, you know, Sidney Toller, uh, people like that. Um, have you, did you ever see the Fu Manchu films at all? Um, yeah, okay, what, what do you remember from the Fu Manchu films? Scary. Scary. too sinister. I couldn't believe that anybody, you know, and, and the Chinese probably fear the worst in the portrayal. So, I mean, the, the very early Fu Manchu films, which are extremely popular, they first appeared as magazine pieces and then books and then films, um, were very powerful. So there's a Charlie Chan and then the Fu Manchu. In some ways, you had these two characterizations. Charlie Chan was uh, actually considered helpful, friendly, good for the dominant culture. Fu Manchu was trying to bring down Western civilization, okay? So you have those two opposite uh, kinds of representations, which in some ways is typical of these kinds of caricatures, right? Um, so, go ahead. Oh, Jerry Lewis playing a Japanese, so he had a routine. Is that what you're thinking of? Or, or oh, he played a houseboy. Yeah, one of his albums, he, 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 he played a houseboy, he had buck teeth, and then he put a rubber band around his, his face so that his eyes appeared to be, quote unquote, slanted, yeah. Um, so if, if we just start digging into this stuff, um, it's kind of endless. Um, I mean, so, um, I, you know, when you go home and, you know, fire up your computers, I just invite you to kind of look up, uh, you know, some of these things. Um, because it's really quite powerful to see, um, in some ways, the, what, the, what the commercial culture and how it represented uh, Chinatown at the time of the Tukai store. Because in some ways, what we have there is it kind of, you know, the letters, if you go, uh, there, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a beautiful kind of um, uh, embroidered, um, uh, fabric with pockets in it. And it may, I don't know if it was actually the Takai store that that was from because this is in many ways a composite of these three stores. Uh, but the, you can see the letters are dated from 1939. Um, so in some ways, as, as Jennifer was saying, you have the documentation of, of a store at a certain time period, but it's really a composite of several stores. Now, so in some ways we think of Chinatown as these stores and these restaurants and these supermarkets or the outdoor markets. And in many ways, that's I think what people think of as Chinatown. Now, why do we think Chinatown exists to begin with? It's a place of community. It's, uh, it's like? It's a place of community. A place of community, yeah. And from what I read when I was, we were over at the store was that it, it was the home away from home. It was something familiar for immigrants who came over from China. Mm -hmm. was, they would find food that they found familiar and everything like that, so it would be a place that they would find comfort in. Yeah, yeah, so, and that's, I, I think, I mean, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, at the same time, I don't know if most people realize that um, there's such a thing as the Chinese exclusion laws. And, and in some ways, those two things need to be put together to actually make sense of why Chinatown existed to begin with. Because in the research we've done of San Francisco and of New York, before the exclusion, Chinatown was called a Chinese quarter. There might have been a few stores like this, but also Chinese were settled in a broader area downtown. But as uh, the anti-Chinese violence increased in the West Coast especially, the driving out, um, sundown communities where people were dri driven out of communities and warned that unless you get out of town by sundown, you're gonna be killed. Um, 
that began to kind of concentrate uh, Chinese who may be migrant workers in the, in the rural areas, but off season they would start going to Chinatown to be the place they could be safely. So part of what happens is that, um, you know, post-Civil War, um, after, um, after Reconstruction is actually dismantled, and Jim Crow laws, segregation laws begin to kind of increase. They are not only happening in the South, but they're also happening in the North. So, um, so I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about the background of, of the Takai store during the time from the 1890s into uh, the 1930s and then to the more contemporary period because in 1965, the immigration laws become deracialized. So from 1882, when the exclusion laws are happening against Chinese, the first group to be targeted for an exclusion law, then through 1924, when eugenics immigration laws are, are set up, then to 1965-68, when the, the laws are opened up. And um, you have the story of the Takai store, in many ways, bridging those time periods. And I just wanted to kind of offer maybe three little vignettes of stories um, that can maybe give you a sense of what Chinatown was about, but also what the Takai store lived through. Um, and really what was behind the Takai store in terms of the context and the people that enabled uh, a Chinese storefront like this to, to be there to begin with. Um, and the role that uh, the small Chinese quarter played in terms of that larger community. Um, so I'm gonna tell you one story um, of, uh, of New York before Chinatown, which was really happening in the 1850s uh, with a person by the name of Kipo Apo. And Kipo, Kipo Apo is someone who is represented in the New York Times uh, in the uh, 1850s as a tea merchant. And he's living on Spring Street, not, not Chinatown. There's no Chinatown at that time, Spring Street. And he's represented as a gentleman who um, is very, um, very polite, a tea merchant, of course, with all the Chinese goods that were valued by the American elites. After all, George Washington, even during the midst of the Revolutionary War, was concerned about his Chinese tea porcelains for his headquarters setting. Um, and, and Chinese tea, of course, and lacquers and silk, and all those kinds of luxury goods were highly prized um, really into, uh, into the 1800s. Um, so being a tea merchant, um, you know, being a Chinese tea merchant was really a, a kind of unusual uh, in, in a place like New York City. And uh, he was considered uh, kind of a gentleman the way he was represented in the New York Times. And when the, during the interview, he was represented as someone who spoke English well. Uh, he was not from Canton. He was not from south southern China, but he was from, uh, from, from elsewhere. Uh, he had been part of a uh, kind of a movement of, of ships and people getting on and off ships uh, through the Pacific into Latin America, into the Caribbean, but also around the Atlantic. And he was someone who uh, was seen as um, uh, really someone who uh, was polite, but also a very shrewd uh, bargainer, which the New York Times uh, writer thought was really wonderful because he was a very shrewd guy. And uh, he, he wrote in his newspaper piece that, oh, you know, he's a, he's, he's a very sharp uh, kind of Yankee type because a customer wanted to buy some coffee and uh, Kimpo Apo said, no, you, you know, you know how, much, uh, how much do you want? And he said, well, you have to buy at least a half a pound um, and, uh, because he didn't want to have uh, a person buying just a little bit of coffee as a way to get change. You know? So he insisted they buy half a pound. And, and that was remarked upon by the New York Times um, writer that, oh, you know, this guy really knows how to bargain and knows how to kind of run a store, which was considered, you know, to be a shrewd Yankee was considered a good value to have, you know, um, as opposed to somebody who was cheap, you know. Um, so these ethnic stereotypes are also playing around quite a bit at that time in terms of the associations that they would have. So Kimpo Apo was considered well-spoken, well, 
be able to speak in English and uh, shrewd and able to kind of operate within the, the rules of what a good kind of Yankee Protestant would do in terms of, of a merchant. Um, but what you have happening uh, represented around the same time, again, we're talking about the 1850s, is you have a different point of view in which uh, suddenly Kimpo Apo appears in the courts and he's accused of having killed his landlady. Uh, so you have in some ways two Kimpo Apos being represented in a very contrasting way. Uh, it turns out that Kimpo Apo has married an Irish woman. Um, they have met and they have two children. And there's a report that somehow he stabbed his landlady and she died, and he's going up for court, and he's being basically convicted. And he was, in fact, uh, convicted, and then he goes for appeal. Um, and you have really newspaper coverage really looking at, so what happened? And it turns out that in his appeal, it comes out that he had, brought, he had hired a judge uh, to defend him, but the judge was late, didn't prepare for the case at all. And when Apo talked about what had happened, he had said that uh, when he got back from work, um, the Irish women in the building uh, were all drunk, he says. Now, we don't know what the actual story is here because that was also a stereotype of Irish, Irish people in general, right, to be drunk. And that, uh, that he insisted that his wife come with him and a fight broke out. And um, he admitted to, um, to knifing the landlady, but he was saying that the women were basically attacking him. So we don't really know what the story is, but all of a sudden he's really represented not as a gentleman, not as a shrewd merchant, not as the kind of uh, uh, person who is really good for um, kind of New York City business, but all of a sudden as a criminal. And uh, he actually gets off um, in that case, but suddenly the shift is very dramatic in terms of how he's being represented. And in some ways that shift is represented by the shift of the culture at large in terms of Chinese being represented as being kind of uh, really gentlemen and merchants and well, res very respectable and part of a luxury market to increasingly being represented as, well, we're not so sure uh, what Chinese are about and that uh, Chinese, in fact, can easily be criminalized as well in these kinds of instances. Um, so in some ways, New York before Chinatown, we're talking about the 1850s, um, you know, is made up of a few individuals like this. Again, he's, his tea store is not in Chinatown on Mott Street, Doyers, uh, Pell Street, uh, which is where Takai is, but up on Spring Street. Very, you know, and you, you say this to people who know Chinatown, you're kind of surprised. Well, how could a Chinese person open up a store on Spring Street? Um, so it was really before, um, as I said, before the segregation of Chinese into this more compacted area that's happening. So what we've discovered in looking at the census material is that um, you actually have uh, Chinese coming into New York through the ports and jumping ship and uh, there would be there'd be groupings of Chinese throughout the downtown area. And a number of these Chinese men uh, ended up actually being partners with Irish women and having children. Again, that's not something that, unless you look at the historical records, census materials, newspaper pieces, you actually realize and think about what well, that's that's not Chinese. That's not Chinatown. Somehow something what's going on here? Um, so Chinatown doesn't really begin to emerge until actually, the 1870s and 1880s and 1890s, just as uh, the time that a store like Takai begins to emerge, and how is it that they're able to uh, have this business? And it's really not so much to serve the tourists. I mean, you go into Takai, part of the thing about the smells is that you smell the herbs, the Chinese herbs, and that this store operated also as a, as a, as a kind of a Chinese herbal store um, that would be serving the people who lived, who were Chinese, lived in the area. But if, the, if in the 1870s you start getting a lot of anti-Chinese um, riots, uh, the, sh the sundown driving out uh, happening on the West Coast, how is it that they get to the East Coast? And in fact, we have people like Kimpo Apo, who's already here in the 1850s, and we have 
census records of Chinese being here um, even earlier, 1820s. Um, and that's way before... From the West Coast East? Pardon? Did they migrate from the West Coast East? Well, so that, that's what I was going to get at. So in some ways, we don't have California becoming part of, uh, part of the United States until the U.S.-Mexican War, and also with the discovery of gold in 1848. So you have Chinese in New York as part of the China trade here before there was even a San Francisco and before there was even a San Francisco Chinatown. Um, so we have to kind of rethink. So that's the usual th thought is that, well, Chinese arrived in San Francisco's Chinatown and they begin moving east. Well, that happens as a second wave. Um, but during the earlier period, you have Chinese as part of the, the port cultures and the maritime trade. Um, now, the other thing that happens in the 1830s and before is that the British are bringing in opium to China, and to southern China especially, to the port of Canton. And uh, we tend to think of the opium wars as something that breaks out in 1839, but in fact, the British are bringing in opium illegally into China, into China. Many people are getting addicted, and it creates this kind of cycle uh, of what do Chinese want? Well, before, Americans couldn't find enough things that the Chinese wanted, but before, during the opium period, be, be during the drug period uh, that the British were inflicting upon China and then the, some of the American traders um, from Boston but also New York uh, began realizing they could actually make uh, money by selling opium. And that becomes something that is, becomes dominant. So part of the context for someone like Kimpo Apo is that he's also a tea merchant at a time in which um, the West has really come to dominate uh, China and change the, the balance of trade by selling opium. And Chinese are beginning to protest that and begin to push back on the opium trade as well and begin to assert their sovereignty as a nation to say, no, we don't want this opium. So the opium wars are precipitated in the 1830s, uh, 1839, especially and again in the late 40s, so that you have the period of the opium wars. Um, which in which people like Kimpo Apo begin to having, he was born in like 1825, he begins, he's lived through the opium wars and ends up in a place like New York in which some of the people who were selling opium were people like John Jacob Astor, um, who you know, bought up a lot of real, real estate from the trade that he made. Uh, and it wasn't all from opium, but it was one of the things that he sold. He of course was known for selling uh, beaver pelts and the town of Astoria in, in Oregon is named after John Jacob Astor because he, he went over there to kind of trade more beaver pelts. Um, so you have, you have Kimpo Apo, but then you have stores like Takai emerging, um, not because um, that these Chinese merchants were able to just sell to a Chinese community that was freely coming here, but a Chinese community was beginning to emerge here really operating uh, hand laundries. And that's something, I don't know how many of you remember Chinese hand laundries uh, here in Albany, but also down in New York City. Some of us older people here remember that. It used to be thousands of hand laundries, um, 10,000 in the New York metropolitan area. Um, and it was those thousands of Chinese laundries uh, that were able to come in, and along with restaurants, right, you have restaurants also emerging, they were able to come into these stores on Sundays and Mondays especially, um, to buy these goods and to pick up the letters and to write letters and to send them out through the stores. And in this case, it was the Lee family. So again, I'd really love to hear any stories that your family would have. The Lee family would then oftentimes handle the letters of Lee family members. So if you're in a laundry in Brooklyn and you're a Lee family member, oftentimes you'd want to patronize the store that was run by someone of your surname that also was connected to a family association. So it was really the history of laundries that we began documenting more and more because we realized there's the 10,000 laundry workers who are in the metro region that were able to support these stores. So it's not like Chinatown emerged out of nowhere. It emerged out of these laundries. And the laundry worker stories oftentimes were not known whatsoever, except the people saw the red sign um, saying Chinese laundry, Chinese hand laundry. And uh, it became 
really that became part of the terrain and landscape of the urban New York City was that there are lots of, there's a, there's a hand laundry in just about every single block of a middle class neighborhood. So people would kind of notice them. And there are all sorts of jokes about no, um, no, no ticky, no shirty. I mean, you probably have heard that, you know, that kind of pigeon kind of speak. Um, and lots of stage plays uh, joking around about that, but also it enters into early films. Uh, there are some silent films that are uh, taking place in laundries and kind of uh, hijinks and kind of people, you know, playing Chinese with pigtails and um, running around um, in a kind of uh, Chinese fire drill type fashion. This is all stuff from the early 1900s. Um, but it's really the thousands of laundries that really enabled the Chinese quarter to begin to emerge and to develop. That was the economic base plus the restaurants. But this is during the period of Chinese exclusion. So in some ways, the Chinatown emerges during the period of exclusion. So it's not because of strictly the reason of Chinese getting together because you want to be with, you know, connected to a home, you want to buy, buy these goods and materials that would remind you so you could cook and bring them back to your lunch. But it's really because Chinatown emerges during the period of exclusion, especially, especially in New York where it's really um, in 1880s that becomes the law of the land. And um, it's really out of that kind of segregation, out of the increasing Jim Crow segregation of not just the South, as I said, but also of urban neighborhoods in which Chinatown becomes more of an enclave in which it's actually hard to uh, find places to live. It's actually very hard for Chinese laundry people to find a place that they could rent to open up a laundry. So that it actually, in terms of kind of living there and working in New York, even a place like New York, which we think of as very liberal and very open, and of course it's an immigrant place, but it be, be, because of the law of the land and because of the stereotypes that are happening on, on the stage uh, and early um, film and, and music and, so, and, uh, um, and sheet music as well, and the songs that are being kind of uh, uh, performed, uh, the stereotypes really become very, very rigid in many ways. So that's when Fu Manchu emerges. That's when um, uh, you know images of, of Chinese women being prostitutes uh, emerge. Um, exotic erotica, you know, kind of uh, representations. But also Charlie Chan begins to emerge at the same time. And these are all representations not done by Chinese themselves, but about Chinese people impersonating in yellow face. So we've heard of blackface quite a bit, but yellow face really begins to emerge as well. So we have um, the stories of people like uh, Tong Pak Chin, who wrote a book uh, called Paper Sun. And it's a memoir that he's written, and we have those papers now. I, used, I was at NYU, we built up an archive at NYU. Uh, his autobiography is really quite remarkable. Uh, Paper Sun, I'd recommend your reading it. Um, because it really gives you a vivid sense of what it meant to be a Chinese laundryman during this period of exclusion. And uh, it's quite poignant because there he is working like crazy, you know, with a, with a very heavy 12-pound hand iron. Um, if you go to the Museum of Chinese America, you'll see that section of the exhibit in which you have the hand iron. Um, and um, and it's, it's literally moving, uh, oh, excuse me, the 8-pound livelihood, my, my my partner Judy is just saying eight, right? Eight pound, so eight pound livelihood, um, and it's this eight pound iron that you're that you're uh, ironing the shirts and and things like that uh, all day. And a number of the laundries we went to uh, behind the counter, you would see that they would be standing on top of the linoleum and then on top of the wooden floors, the slatted wooden floors, and that that spot would be worn down all the way into the wood itself because that person was standing there for so many hours every day, um, weeks and weeks upon a time, year after year, as a way of just ecking out a living during a period in which it was very hard to be Chinese in this country. So laundries was, uh, in some ways, the kind of core laundries and later on restaurants are part of the core history that we tend not to know about. Um, but that's part of the history that we start documenting at the New York Chinatown History Project, interviewing laundry workers and trying to get their stories. If you talk to any of the old time uh, merchants in Chinatown, 
they of course knew all these stories. They knew all the people. They knew the stories of what was happening in the outer boroughs from which the laundry men would come to from China, uh, to go to for Chinatown. Um, so in in many ways, the story of New York being a nation of immigrants or a city of immigrants, and the nation JFK talked to John, you know, uh, Fitzgerald Kennedy talked about our being a nation of immigrants. He began to kind of play out that story, is not entirely accurate. Because what we have is that we have the Chinese story uh, really in terms of trade and um, uh, being laborers on the Transcontinental Railroad, reclaiming lands, uh, but also um, uh, being a part of the China market as being in some ways connected to uh, really earlier colonial history. And, and I understand that really in the restaging of the hall, that larger story that hasn't generally been told is now fin finally going to be told, and I'm really happy that's going to be told. So that, beginning with the glacier, the glaciers, the indigenous people, Algonquian peoples, as well as Haudenosaunee peoples, what happened? How they began? They were populating this region first, and then how Dutch colonists and how British colonists, competing oftentimes with each other, began to enter into these areas. So the dispossession of lands is something that we really have generally not talked about. And that dispossession of land, but also ens uh, enslavement being tied to that, also was linked to the international trade. What did China want? And the Chinese workers who began coming into this country as well. It was all around uh, what Alexander Hamilton talked about as political arithmetic, really how trade could be a way to enrich uh, a country that comes out of the war, the Revolutionary War against Britain, really poor and really impoverished. A place like New York City was impoverished, uh, and the axis between Albany and New York City, that history was, was in peril because the Revolutionary War meant that um, where was this country going to build its wealth? And this is before the Erie Canal, right? This is before the wealth of the region really builds up because of 1925 with the Erie, Erie Canal being completed. So how is it going to be built? It was really in part through the China trade. Uh, that the, the chains of relationships of exchange that happened with the China trade was really a way in which that was going to build up the wealth, according to Alexander Hamilton. Um, so we have these two moments in which Kimpo Apo and someone like uh, Tong Pak Chin, who's a laundryman, um, really uh, are two of those stories that I kind of wanted to kind of relate to. But the third story is of the so-called mayor of Chinatown, who's actually a person by the name of Chuck Connor. Not, I'm not talking about the rifleman Chuck Connor. Okay, I'm talking about Chuck Connor, who was actually uh, kind of one of the original Bowery Boys. And I don't know if you've watched any, you know, of the early films, but the Bowery Boy figure oftentimes appeared in speaking with a very heavy uh, New York City accent that was a little bit like Cockney in terms of kind of a a London Cockney kind of accent. And it was really considered one of the uh, comical figures in early stage, but also in early film. So Chuck Connor was a prize fighter. Um, he wrote a biography, but mainly he was uh, a creature of, uh, of a, a, pulp, a publisher. And we can kind of appreciate this now in many ways because of the way we know about how publishing works. Um, who uh, the publisher, I'm just looking for the publisher's name now, um, was, um, his last name was Fox, and he published the Police Gazette, which is a, a weekly broadside that would have um, drawings on it, and later on published uh, photographs. And it was really for uh, people who were uh, considered themselves um, kind of part of the, um, uh, the sporting set of New York City. They'd like to go to the horses, they'd like to uh, gamble, they'd like to um, uh, bet on um, uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, kinds of things that would be going on in New York City. And it was really kind of a whole class of people that was a mixture of people of, of kind of middle class and upper middle class men who would be slumming in the downtown areas, but then also authentic people such as Chuck Connor. So Chuck Connor was dubbed by um, the um, Richard Fox's Police Gazette as the mayor of Chinatown. And in fact, he had a free apartment that George Fox rented for him on Doyer Street. 
And uh, so, so Chuck Connor really became the kind of a fixture of what emerged during the exclusion period as Chinatown. And so this, this part of the story of Chinatown in some ways is not so much um, the one of exclusion, but the story of the Gilded Age and what happens when Chinatown in some ways is trying to figure out how to make a living during the period of exclusion. So having the business from laundries is not really quite enough money to really do well. Uh, and what people begin to see is that there are people who are coming down to places like Chinatown, Little Italy, the Jewish Lower East Side, to kind of gawk, to be slummers, so-called, to look at what this older part of New York City that's still there is all about. People who are well-dressed, uh, who are living uptown because the city has moved uptown, new immigrants who are coming in who have some money, and they're coming in to look at the downtown really as exotica, not just of old New York exotica, but actually these foreign foreigners who appear to be creating their own community. Um, and, and so Chuck Connor really um, is really part of that new kind of gilded Chinatown in which he figures he can actually make some money. And this again is really in connection with a newspaper and selling newspapers um, by giving tours of Chinatown. And he arranges with two friends um, uh, who um, Georgie Yi and uh, Blonde Lulu, who are people that he knows, to, um, to be in this apartment and to be um, staging opium smoking. And um, as part of his tour, he'd be taking people around, showing them, and you could look at these pamphlets, these booklets that were published you know, by George Fox, of course, in which you could see him visiting different stores and different scenes, and then going behind the scenes to an opium door that was staged with his two friends who were smoking opium. And of course, opium smoking, again, is part of this master narrative that's really happening in this country because of the opium wars, but also opium becomes associated with Chinese criminals, as you're saying, you know. Chinese become, in some ways, the, the problem as opposed to the, being the victim of opium. And they're bringing in opium into the city and poisoning uh, innocent white women that becomes the headlines of Chinatown, right? Of poisoning innocent white women of, uh, of, uh, of drugs. Uh, so um, Chuck Connor is kind of operating in this really interesting, complicated way as an Irish person who is a boxer, and he's now called the mayor of Chinatown uh, to represent really and to show in some ways, to give tours of Chinatown in this very different way. It's a way to make some money for some of the merchants. Um, but it's complicated because the merchants have to go along with this, the restaurants have to go along with it in, in some way or another. And it becomes part of the complexity of what it, does it mean to be living in a country that has, that you're, in which you're being excluded and you have to be on your very best behavior. In some ways, this is the Charlie Chan. This is the Fu Manchu and Charlie Chan kind of binary. You're caught either as uh, an opium fiend or someone who's uh, promoting opium, Fu Manchu. Boris Karloff played Fu Manchu in those early films, right? And he was known for his monster characterizations, a man of a thousand faces who could really uh, present evil or the mummy or other kinds of caricatures. So in this case, um, Boris Karloff uh, really does a film that's based on the British um, character of Fu Manchu. And Fu Manchu, of course, arrives in this country and becomes as much a part of this country as in, his, as in London. Uh, but then the other alternative is Charlie Chan, who is considered the good guy. So you have both of these binaries. None of them, neither of them, are realistic people. They're not really embodying the stories of laundrymen, or the stories of the Lee family, of the Takai store. These stories are much more complicated. But those complicated stories are not what sells in the Police Gazette, uh, nor in, in stage plays, nor in films. It's really the simplification of people's lives that, um, that sell, and it's really within the framework of a whole racial hierarchy of how blacks are represented, how Italians, how Jews are represented, later on how Puerto Ricans are represented, but they come later, okay? <laughs> a lot later, yeah. Uh, but get trapped into these stereotypes nonetheless, right? Because these really become part of the kind of uh, 
way in which the, the culture, the commercial culture, especially of New York City operates. And then as you're walking around the city itself, tourist sites get set up to really cash in on these kind of prevailing strong attitudes. But we, what we have behind this, I'm just gonna end up here. I'm gonna end here and I'm happy to just, um, you know, respond to any questions or questions that uh, kind of things that don't make sense. Um, but what happens is really that the complicated stories of Chinese, of the laundry men themselves, uh, of the store owners, of the families that come out of these uh, Chinatown, those stories generally uh, are not known about. So that we have that kind of barrier, the front stage, which is really for the commercial space, for what's on stage, uh, what's in the popular culture, what sells, uh, the dishes that people buy at Chinese restaurants that may not be authentic, but are suited more for American tastes. And then you have the quote unquote backstage, which is really the more complicated story. And I think all of the cultures that people come from in this room probably can see that difference between front stage of the culture that you come from and the backstage of the real stories, the complicated stories. But that complexity is too complex for the commercial culture. It's not what sells. It's not how, how people really circulate in a place like New York City, unless you happen to know people who can really share those stories with you. Um, so, um, so I just wanted to tell you those three stories because those three stories in some ways are what really are behind the scenes of the Takai store. Because the people who work in the store, who come to the store, the laundry workers and restaurant workers, they are all talking to each other. They know these more complicated stories. They know what's really going on in terms of exclusion laws, but they also are linked to a larger Chinese diaspora in which the, if we're to look at the accounting books, we probably see records of things that are being coming from the South, you know, perhaps um, certain, kinds of, um, uh, certain kinds of medicinal uh, herbs, but also um, you see in the front window that snake um, skin, the snake that's there, that's used for certain kinds of medicines. Um, and those things come from all over this country, but also from Latin America, from the Caribbean, um, from many, many different places. So you have these Chinese merchants who are really linked to networks of oftentimes related family members, but also relationships of relationships that are global. And those stories are circulating. They're circulating in Chinese newspapers, Chinese language newspapers, in the letters that are being written back and forth. And it's those stories that really tell <clears throat> the complexity of the story that we yet have fully documented. Um, so um, I, I just kind of want to end there and really in some ways um, uh, say that if we go through that door and all of a sudden if you could actually understand um, the Cantonese that's being spoken and the many different dialects of Cantonese being, being spoken, oftentimes the people in, in New York Chinatown spoke uh, Toysanese. Um, Seventy percent of the people spoke from Toysanese, which is for this one small county. Uh, outside of the city of Canton, of, of Guangzhou city itself. And the great many of the New Yorkers were really from that place. So they spoke a dialect. And from people I've spoken to, sometimes if you're in the countryside, even if you're across the river uh, in Toysan, they would speak a slightly different accent. Um, so it was really in places like New York where you had Toysanese gathering, but also people from other counties gathering, speaking, uh, their dialects and learning what would be understandable to each other. Uh, city dialects, country dialects, uh, people from other parts of China, but also speaking to people like Chuck Connor, um, who you know, spoke with that kind of Bowery brogue. You know? And part of the thing about a brogue is that, um, those of you who know, remember, a brogue is oftentimes associated with an Irish accent, right? But a brogue is actually a shoe. So it's like speaking with a shoe in your mouth, which then, of course, is also part of the Irish stereotype of, you know, they're not speaking proper English, you know. <laughs> um, so all these kinds of images and representations are kind of commingled and intermixing in really what is a port culture. And we tend not to understand New York City as a port culture, but in fact, that's what it was. It was a port culture in which ships were coming from all over the Atlantic world, people being working on the ships who were being treated badly, oftentimes by the ship captains, were jumping ship, 
because they just couldn't stand it anymore. And other people would be brought onto the ship from all the different ports, not only around the Atlantic world, not only uh, going through Latin America, Central America, Africa. Of course, we had enslaved people at this time, but also African crew members, Europe, but also going into the Pacific, right? If we think of uh, Herman Melville and, um, you know, the, you know, uh, Queequeg and other kinds of characters who are from the Pacific. Well, how do they show up in New York? Well, they and, and um, in in Massachusetts. Well, it's really part of that kind of complicated global trade that's going on, which sets the stage for uh, what's happening in a small store like this. Um, so um, I just want to encourage you to then um, maybe uh, next time you go into the store, think about the complex lives, That's, this is not just like a Chinese drugstore or a Chinese general goods store. The, the historical context of what's happening here is so much more complex. And also a lot of these stories are actually really difficult. So difficult that family members oftentimes would not even tell them because they were just so painful about what happened uh, during the exclusion period. Um, but fortunately, um, because of the museum's foresight and being able to uh, buy that store um, and not have it just tossed away in the trash in the in the in the dumpsters, and also because that we have enough post 1965 um, young people who are getting educated and getting able to go to college, able to get jobs, and some of them able to uh, start collecting these materials as we did with the New York Chinatown History Project and develop an archive. Um, people began also writing books and researching these stories. Um, so part of what's going on and part of why I'm able to tell you, tell you these stories is that people have been writing about them. So one, one book I wanted to share with you besides Paper Sun, which I do recommend highly, that was written by uh, Tung Pak uh, Chen, um, is another book called The Chinese Laundryman, who was actually uh, written by the son of a laundryman in Chicago who writes about, he went around interviewing um, in uh, Cantonese um, the, the stories of his father's uh, co-laundry workers in Chicago. And it gives you a very vivid sense of what that life behind the counter was all about. Um, and we also began to interview a lot of laundry workers. That became our first major project, is to really, really look at the history of laundry workers, because by looking at that history, you begin to understand Chinatown itself and why it emerged. Um, and as I said, New York existed before Chinatown, so that's something I wrote in my dissertation when I was at NYU, and then it later got published. And it really begins to try to uh, grapple with the question of why does Chinatown emerge to begin with? What does that have to do with the China trade? What does that have to do with the United States, which is at a period and was try it's desperately poor. It's trying to come out of debt, trying to come out of the uh, Revolutionary War against uh, its mother country. And how does it begin to make money? How do people like Benjamin Franklin and Alexander Hamilton begin to kind of imagine the China trade as a way to kind of rescue uh, the American economy, or uh, begin to think, oh, actually, we know about the Grand Canals in China. Maybe we can build a canal in this country that can open up the markets of the interior. So we tend to not understand China at a time in which it was really the place in which all European countries went to to get things, to get the luxury goods. China was very powerful. It had a, a very strong uh, balance of trade to the point in which the Opium War happens. The, the relationships, the understandings of wealth and power begin to shift and tilt. And then that leads in many ways to the kind of growing arrogance between the British and the Americans and the Anglo-American wor uh, world against Chinese. The Fu Manchu image really begins to emerge, the association of Chinese with opium. Um, and in fact, the representation of Kimpo Apo begins to change as well. Um, so, um, and then we have this period now in which, well, we had this period in which Nixon goes to China in 1972. Uh, all of a sudden, in that seven-day trip, uh, he has a banquet with Mao, and that banquet is being reproduced in Chinese restaurants all around the country. So people are, are, are kind of finding, refining Chinese food, but they want to eat that banquet food. They want to go visit um, uh, what it means to eat authentic Chinese food and not the chop suey food, right? Um, but now we're at a point in which 
it's flipping again. In which China is becoming increasingly seen as a competitor, economic competitor, but also increasingly being represented as a military competitor. So I'm really worried about what's happening because I'm worried that in some ways, if we look at the sweep of history, these representations can flip in a way that also are linked to war, are linked to balance of trade issues, are, are linked to all sorts of fundamental questions that could be very dangerous, I think, for really the world, especially at this point in which we're really trying to deal with global warming. And you know, the scientists are saying that we've got six to 10 years, six to 10 years in which we can really, we really have to reverse um, what's happening. So what happens in New York after Chinatown as well? And there's a question of solar panels, there's a question of rare earth minerals that are used for batteries. There's a question of where does the plastics that this country is really consuming and throwing away, where does it go? Well, China doesn't want them anymore, right? So what happens? How does China get represented in that world, which is really part of a continuous historical uh, pattern that we can understand? So I'm just gonna finish with a little bit about Kimpo Apo, which is that um, by the time that the Chinese exclusion law is passed, he's actually um, in an insane asylum. He's actually having uh, paranoid delusions about the Fenians, the Irish, who are gonna come out and try to kill him. Um, and it's hard to say, you know, we don't know, we will never know probably enough about Kimpo Apo because the historical documents are just not there. But the little bits and pieces that appear about him shows the sweep of a man who starts out as this respectable New York Times tea merchant to the point that, we, that he is represented as being on, trail, on trial for having killed his landlady, and what's happening between Chinese and Irish, um, and then to the point where he's in an insane asylum, and he's really um, spouting all sorts of uh, fantasy stories about what's happening. Um, so in some ways, that shift and pivot is also representative of what happens to the Chinese really being involved as traders, Chinese merchants um, of luxury items that Americans want, to the point in which Chinese exclusion happens and Chinese are represented as being dangerous for this country. But also then you have Charlie Chan's way emerging who can be helpful for Americans. You have a complicated kind of story there. But in some ways they're all cardboard cartoonish figures to the point in which um, uh, Kimpo Apo really cannot uh, manage his sanity in this country. We don't know what the cause for that is, but in some ways he becomes symbolic of the changing kind of attitudes and feelings that are going on. So in some ways I think the open question is what is gonna to happen today and um, how are Chinese being represented? Uh, Chinese are being accused of being spies and stealing state secrets. Um, if you read the Chinese papers, you know about that happening, but it tends not to appear quite so much in the mainstream press. But some of you may remember the story of Wen Ho Lee, Dr. Wen Ho Lee, who was accused of having stolen the, uh, the crown jewels of American nuclear secrets. Uh, he was a person who worked at Los Alamos. He's from Taiwan, which is anti-communist. Um, but he was accused of having stolen those, those secrets and having given it to China. China. He was later on uh, exonerated, and in fact, Judge Parker apologized to him. If you look up Wen Ho Lee, you'll remember uh, that the New York Times had a lot of coverage, and in fact, they reported that he was actually guilty even before the trial happened. Um, so we have that continuing now, except a lot of what's going on in terms of Chinese academics being accused of, of uh, trading um, Chinese secrets or giving, uh, Chinese, uh, giving American research to China. Um, uh, that's going on, but it's not nearly getting the same kind of attention um, that uh, Dr. Wen Holdi uh, got. Um, so we're actually, I think, a very precarious, danger, dangerous time right now. Um, I, and I worry quite a bit because uh, you just don't know how things turn in this country and um, how racial representations and attitudes of white, white supremacy that we now know in terms of anti-blackness, and we've seen it very clearly, how that also affects uh, other peoples uh, and Asians historically as well. Um, so um, I don't mean to end on a, on a heavy uh, negative note. Um, there's actually a lot that we can learn in terms of how to prevent that from happening and how that can um, 
how that oftentimes flips from Japanese being the enemy to Chinese being the enemy to Koreans being the enemy. Um, and it's really, I think, through this kind of discussion and surfacing what's going on and no knowing something about these, the history, American history, that I think gives us the best chance of actually um, trying to prevent that from happening again. So um, yeah, so I'd love to just respond to any questions that people may have. I'm not even sure how much time we have left, but um, we have a little bit of time. Okay, great. So I'd love to just, any, any questions or comments that people wanna make, um, how links back to Tuck High or anything that people have been thinking about that links to things that I've been talking about, love to hear anything, so. Oh, that's from the store itself. That's the original store. Okay, great. Yeah. Oh. oh, okay. So can, would you mind telling us a little bit about what you remember from the store? All the workers were chain smokers, you know, so all of those smells, the smokes and the food, you know, that they would, because they, uh, they work six, seven days a week. So, you know, they had a cook that they hired just to cook breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And my mom would tell me, you know, your dad would come home, throw us some food, and run back to the store, you know, because they were so, I wouldn't say dedicated, but it was just their life, you know, and you had to work that hard. But I would, I would tell my dad, how come you have to work? Can't you take like, one day off? And he'd go, everybody works that way, you know, not just the Chinese, the white people, he would say, you know, I guess the Italians, because they were in the same area. But it was just a different time, you know, and that's what they had to do. But all of that, you know, the, there was a cook that actually cooked three days, and they would close the store for an hour, and then, you know, right in front they would set up a, a table, and they would all eat together, and, you know, and then they'd get really fast, and they would get by, right back to work. And um, it was very, I learned a lot from you today, too, because I didn't know about the laundry, you know, that a lot of, you know, that could have been, I don't know. But it's true, because I know, I have a friend whose parents, had a hand laundry, but that was in um, in the Bronx, not in this Chinatown. And um, I, I have another friend who came over, the, the family came over with a paper son, and they, they started even earlier, in the early 1900s, with, uh, with uh, you know, living in Connecticut. And apparently there was a big Chinese community over there too. But they would travel into this Chinatown also. And my mom said that in those days, it was only one block, Mont Street. And like you said, the Pell Street cross and then Doyle Street around, you know, and just like that. And, um, you know, it was just a very small community and it was just a place where they would feel safer, you know. But even then, way back in the 1950s, 40s, it was safe for them. They didn't feel like they couldn't walk, you know, outside of the community either. They could walk all the way down to the financial district now and it would be very safe for them. But as a whole, they stayed together because it was familiar, you know, because they don't speak the language either. You know? mm -hmm. So, but anyway. <laughs> no, thank you. And um, uh, did you, so how old were you when you went to visit the store? Well, um, we lived in Chinatown on, uh, oh, I forget what street that is. You know, right near the, not right near the tombs. Okay, yeah. On, on Baxter. Baxter. <laughs> Baxter, yeah, okay. Yeah, so it was just uh, two, three blocks, you know? Yeah. So, um, of course, then we were, w I went there from the time we were, you know, little kids, babies, up until the time they closed, which is when I was about 20, you know, around 20 years old. And, um, you know, as I was telling you earlier, they didn't really want us to go. You know, as immigrants, they wanted us to do better they wanted us to go to school, go to college, you know, so they would always try to keep us away, you know. But I would visit, and of course, every time we went there, we wanted something from the store, you know, so he'd give us a treat. But then... Some candy uh, or something, or what? What did we get? Or a toy. Oh, a toy. A or a toy. doll. Oh, yeah, they used to have these paper, paper toys, you know, like a puppet, you know. Yeah. We'd always get one of those. Uh, you don't seem to have that in the store. Today. Also, I mean, yeah. there are very few girls in Chinatown, right? Well, when my mom came, yes. Yeah. She came in 1956 or something. Uh -huh. And because um, he married late, though, my father, you know. And she was young. And when she had us, she goes, 
every time you walked out, all these eyes would be like looking at you. Yeah. <laughs> She's a woman. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you know, and at that, that time, like you said, before 1965, there was the Exclusion Act. So all these guys couldn't, they had no wives, no, no girlfriends. So it was all on the one day off, or the, the one hour off, or whatever time they had off, oh. they would just sit outside. They had nowhere to go. Oh. And even now, there's apartments down there where people um, have to room together, and they share a bed, not even just a room. Yeah, the beds would be shared in shifts sometimes. Right, right? exactly. Yeah, so, yeah. So There's also old New York, yeah. Yeah, and even when I was working down there in the, I don't know, 1990s, I would hear stories about that. I said, really, still? So there's stories that you're telling now. It's happening even now, yeah. you know? And, you know, they hide it. They want people to know. But, you know, they would live in their cars. Nowadays, they make a little bit more, so they're able to afford a, a car. Yeah. And sometimes you go down there and you say, you're moving? You know, because that's like gold to have a parking spot, you know. But they go, no. And they're just sitting there reading the paper, eating their lunch, because that's their space. And because they might work here, but they might have a family somewhere else, you know. Yeah. And that's, it still exists even today. Yeah. That kind of life, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, why don't you give the microphone, because you may want to answer some other questions that people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm but um, I, do people know what a paper son or a paper daughter is? <laughs> we, should, we should explain that so that um, you know that the, in 1906, San Francisco had that earthquake and fire. And what happened is that a lot of the immigration records were destroyed. So, you know, for Chinese exclusion, you have uh, Angel Island, which is out in the bay near Alcatraz. It's an island nearby Alcatraz. And and um, that's where the immigration detention center was. But before then, um, it was just down really on the shoreline. And the immigration records were really what was uh, able to certify whether you were a um, merchant or you came before the exclusion laws and somehow you could stay, or were you somehow um, not properly documented. And what a lot of people did is after the earthquake and fire, they, they said, well, I, I, I am an immigrant and the papers were destroyed. Um, uh, or the merchants would also then say, that the merchants were able to uh, come over. And if you're a student, a scholar, or a merchant, those were the excluded categories. Uh, merchants, remember, were, you know, like the, the you know, Kipo Apo, the honorable merchant, you know. Um, so merchants could claim that they went back to China and had usually a son <laughs> and then um, you know, claim that so that someone would maybe buy that, that, those papers and assume that ide those identities. So these are things that are generally not talked about within a community, but I think it's actually important to talk about because it really talks about what happens during the exclusion period and how people really are trying to go around what they felt were unjust laws. Um, so by buying a paper, one assumes those identities, but that also means that at a place like Angel Island, you have to go through a test and being basically examined uh, to answer questions such as, how many feet was this tree in front of your house? You know, this a certain kind of tree, a ginkgo tree. Um, how many windows did your house have? How many, you know, so you, you go through a battery of tests and that's a lot of what was part of the very bitter experience that people had of having to go through these tests, um, whether you actually had, you were actually that person or not, um, how many of us could actually, you know, go through a hundred questions like that and answer sufficiently well with all the pressure that's going on. So, um, so the paper sun was a way to get around what were perceived by the Chinese as racist immigration laws and also uh, unfair exclusions that were, that were happening. Um, so a lot of people have paper names and they didn't reveal their paper names so that they were actually a Chen, but they, their paper name said Li, so they kept the Li name. And oftentimes the children didn't even know that. Uh, so it's really having to live within the shadow of this kind of uh, 
uh, law. Yeah, I don't know if there, uh, if if. Yeah, I have you know uh, family members or friends, you know, families that have it, and a lot of times in English you'll have the paper name, and you'll just go through life that way because it just makes life easier because you don't have to go through the legal process. But in Chinese, they'll use their Chinese name. Yeah. But it's true. As time goes on, the generations, they'll just keep the paper name, or whatever the, the official name is, because, you know, it does, it becomes less important, I guess, you know, but that's what they, they tend to do. Or some families like to use both names, you know, that I find. Yeah, yeah. So again, that's part of the complexity uh, behind the scenes uh, in a culture that's really insisting that, mm -hmm. you know, all the Chinese laundrymen be called Charlie, for example, you know, Charlie after Charlie Chan, but also Charlie, you know. Um, but then, you know, what was their real names? You know, and, and the customers who may have frequented that laundry for 10, 20 years may never have really known much about who that person really was because those barriers between the front stage and the backstage were so, so severe. It was language, but it's not just language because um, for most immigrants coming to this country, if the barriers were not there, they would have learned the language. It was, it was easier for that to happen. But because of the exclusion laws, it made it actually really hard to kind of cross those, those barriers. Yeah. Well, and, um, it makes sense when you said about the laundry people being one of the first, uh, you know, uh, first pop, you know, the first group that came over and needing a lot of the services. I'm not quite sure. I honestly don't know how my my grandfather and his uncle before him established the store because that goes back so far back. You know, the stories are kind of lost a little. Yeah. But um, I do know that they said about my grandfather that one of the reasons why he was so successful was that he was very smart and he was able to learn English, you right. know, whereas a lot of the Chinese could not. And that is why one of the reasons I had that postal uh, office there because a lot of the workers couldn't learn the English. And, or even in Chinese, they were illiterate. Yeah. And so he would help them write letters, not just use it as a, as a station, you right. know, but to like, translate and write for them too, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, and that, that skill would also carry over into the courts um, so that if there's a court case or one had to get a license for something or file some papers, mm -hmm. oftentimes there's the educated merchants in the stores who would provide that service for them, yeah for a small cost. It was really kind of a community center um, in some ways, right? Yeah. Yes. And, yeah. and they were open seven, you know, seven, if not six and a half days a week. And so they were there all the time. Yeah. The only time they would close is the most important holiday, not Christmas, Chinese New Year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but even then, they would open the doors and they would have that little table and put, you know, the symbolic symbols, you know, a little bowl of oranges, a little lice, you know, the red envelopes. And, you know, they would, if you came in and you were a friend, you, you know, you would get tea, a cup of tea with them, you know? So it was, yes, I heard the stories on that too. And I even have an old picture somewhere with that, you know, with the little uh -huh. set up there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I, I think what you had said earlier is that it was kind of a, a home away from home. If you understand the historical context of this and how isolated so many of these men were, they had families back in China, or you know, I mean, they or and they hadn't seen them for years, if not decades. They had children who didn't know who they were, you know, but they were sending back money if they could, and that was keeping the family going, you know, back in their homeland. So it was that kind of little community that these men created for themselves, right? mm -hmm. um, and that's why you have the, the cook. And you know, so that was also a very important service that the store provided because these men really didn't necessarily have kitchens that they could go to, but they also had to work so hard. Yeah. So, um, and, you know, I'd love to hear any questions or comments that people have. Yeah, please. This is also complicated. I mean, every everything you said, just like the Chinese aren't—they're part of the Asian diaspora. Right. Okay, but there and there's no. You're, you're Japanese, you're Korean, you're Chinese. Oh, could you hand that? It's for all of them. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't even want to go there. There's a Chinese diaspora, and then when Chinese are excluded, uh, Japanese laborers are brought in, mm -hmm. and then the Jap Japanese are excluded, you know, <laughs> and then other groups come in. So, so Asian labor, especially in the West Coast, is really key for the agricultural development and all that I'm stuff. I'm mostly so, thinking about New York, you know, coming into New York, and the laundry is an obvious thing. But pretty quickly, the white people want to have Asians, Chinese, um, living in their house. 
Oh, you mean to be house servants? House servants. Yeah. Uh, you know, and there were television shows that glorified this in, in the 60s and the 50s. There's one I remember, Bachelor Father. That's right. And, and With John Forsythe. John Forsythe, <laughs> but I don't remember who the, the, the person that I would love to, would love to have in my household because he really, you know, did everything. Yeah. But there must be a trade, and I'm not talking about the illicit trades, just for domestics, for cooks, yes. for nannies. Right. Um, you know, I, it's just, I yeah. don't know how you get a handle on any of that. Well, and that's, that's an area that hasn't been written about much. I mean, um, Leland Stanford, who is one of the big four railroad magnets and then, you know, uh, contributed money to set up Stanford University, he had many house servants. Sure. Um, and, you know, so the big four all had Chinese house servants. And that practice continued out here in the East as well, so that um, in any wealthier area, if you couldn't get an Irish, well, so first of all, Irish women had, they were stereotyped often, and they were seen as unreliable. And then somehow Chinese male house servants were seen as reliable. Um, you know, doing the work of a Chinese laundry man was also kind of working against the stereotype of whose gendered labor is being waged, right? Was it Irish women, black women, Chinese men in terms of laundries, right? So you have these complexities of who does what in these kinds of uh, quote unquote, lower forms of labor. And then being a house servant was, a, was more elevated um, as well. Um, you, weren't, you weren't quite segregated in that we way. We study African slavery here in the American society. Yeah. But I mean, the whole thing, I mean, it's house servant, field servant. Um, right. What they did with, with young men who were of a uh, virile age, right. they weren't going to be around the women. Yeah. And so a building like this, how tall was it? How many stories? Oh, uh, this would be, uh, how, was it five stories? Yeah. Yeah. Is that all? Yeah. Because I remember looking up at, at some of these places and it was full of old men looking out the windows. Yeah, right. Those are the old timers. As I could see. Um, Those are the bachelor men who were basically stranded here. I mean, so a lot of that stuff that was being thrown out of the apartments that uh, we were uh, dumpster diving in were really apartments that were, um, being uh, where the old timers were passing off, the few belongings they had were being tossed, the photographs, the letters, whatever they were, were being tossed out. Treasures. Uh, people from, from uh, after 1965, 68, when the laws finally opened up against Asians, then uh, all these immigrants coming from Hong Kong, uh, elsewhere were coming. They were moving into the lower rent uh, places of Chinatown and they found it convenient. Uh, but they knew nothing about the older men who were here. Um, I would go to college with some people from New York, and they were saying, "Oh yeah, you know those are men. They were they were um, uh, they were lechous. They were lecherous old men. You know, it's just kind of there's no understanding of who these older men were. Oh, they're just scary old men. Scary old men who they didn't have a connection with, um, and they were not understood to be kind of extended not family women. members. Yeah." W women didn't live in these circumstances. Well, the, uh, the imbalance of numbers of women to men only changed after the immigration laws took effect in 68. Mm -hmm. that, that, it happened only then. Up until then, the imbalance was, you know, sometimes 90 to 1, 90, to, you know, 100 to 5. I mean, that, just really women were really not uh, encouraged. It wasn't oftentimes considered safe. But also, I think historians really believe that um, really, this country did not want Chinese families to emerge until after the exclusion law. So that they could buy a house. Hmm? Until they could buy a house. Yeah. So you know, and you know, lots of um, racial covenants continued um, actually for a long time. So when my family arrived, we, you know, we were not Cantonese. We were come from the South, Jiangxi Province, but um, we we tried to move. I, w I was the anchor baby in the family. I was the American citizen who was born on the American soil. That enabled my parents to stay. And then when we tried to move to um, uh, a western suburb, uh, Oak Park, outside of Chicago, uh, the racial covenants were still in effect in the 50s. Um, so these, thing these things continued in American society for a very long time. I think those of us who remember those days are not shocked. But oftentimes, the younger generations can't believe that this is the same country they assume to be very open.
right? But things were not always so open, you know, not that long ago. And as you say, they continue, there continue to be problems uh, to this day. Uh, would anybody else like to have a question or just raise a point that hasn't been touched on? I'd love to hear from more people as well. So. Oh, yes, okay, go over here. Let's, let's, let's pass the mic over here. We're, this session is being recorded, so they just want to have. I know this uh, question may not be particularly relevant to uh, Chinatown, uh, but I was wondering if you had any insights on any of the connections between Chinatown and the, a lot of the Asian enclaves that developed in parts of Queens, was it subsequent to, to 1968, or was it something that may have sort of developed contemporaneously to, to Chinatown? Well, so after, after 68, um, the exclusion laws open up and you have quotas um, so that uh, it's, it's suddenly able, you're able to have, let's say, 10,000 people a year come from Taiwan. A uh, certain number of people come from Hong Kong, uh, elsewhere. You know, these, these used to be kind of racial laws. In other words, if you were a British citizen but of Chinese descent, you were affected by the exclusion laws. It didn't matter that you were actually a British subject. Um, but if you were seen as racially Chinese, so you get all sorts of issues with um, in, in Hawaii, for example, and other places in which people can't tell who's who, but they're being subject to the anti-Chinese exclusion law, so you have to be proving that, oh, I'm not Chinese, I'm Japanese, or whatever, you know. Um, but, uh, uh, but, but what happens is that um, Queens, um, if you kind of arrive in New York in um, uh, the uh, 1970s, uh, for example, um, my partner grew up as, uh, you know, I'm not going to single her out, but she's over there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Jewish family, grew up in Lower East Side, went to the Bronx, then to Queens. Um, Flushing was changing dramatically in the 70s. Those, those of you who remember New York, it was kind of an empty place. A lot of the big stores that had been there maybe were still there. They're kind of surviving, but a lot of the smaller businesses were not making it. And then all of a sudden, you start getting more and more Chinese arriving, but they're oftentimes from Taiwan. There's some Hong Kong Cantonese, but a lot of them now, if you're there, you really see a lot of um, people from Taiwan who speak a different dialect. Um, and also it's a complex story because of the Civil War and those who lost, Chiang Kai-shek who lost the Civil War went to Taiwan uh, and occupied Taiwan. Uh, and then Hong Kong are very different than mainland Chinese because Hong Kong itself had a 99-year lease, the British had a 99-year lease. So that was a very different kind of cultural system um, and how it still remains to be impacted to this day. So from each of those places, people began arriving and setting up their own little community because um, you know, the Toysan Cantonese and Chinatown were not necessarily that um, connected to the Taiwan people who are speaking uh, Mandarin or Taiwanese, right? Very different. So that those folks would kind of set up their own area. Um, so you know, in um, in that way, they were more like um, because they could settle in different places. They began creating their own communities um, in a way that were not affected by the racist laws or segregation quite in the same way. Um, so. Uh, large numbers of other Asian immigrants, including Filipinos, Koreans. I mean, we now know any of the any of you who go to New York City will see those large communities that are in New Jersey and New York, Long Island, um, uh, Route One in New Jersey. Uh, large communities of South Asians, for example, and not just South Asians, but um, Bangladeshis, and then you know Sri Lankans and people who are kind of uh, creating their own businesses and their own communities. So in some ways, those stores are now being created. Um, and they exist now, and they're making their own histories, but they're not under the pall of exclusion. And that makes a big difference, so that their children are able to get jobs more freely, go to get an education more freely. And in some ways, I think that's part of what the representation of Asians as a model minority is in part about because this, this exclusion has happened for so long, and people now coming in 
um, actually are really eager to try to make the best out of this situation as quickly as they can. Um, and of course, as, as, as you were saying, there's a lot of pressure to, uh, to do really well in school. <laughs> and not necessarily to kind of choose your own major, but to do what your parents want you to do because you're really expressing your love and your relationship. Probably as someone who comes out of an immigrant family, you have, have probably some of that experience yourself. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but. Um, yes, yes it did, thank yeah, you. Yeah, sure. Um, any other comments or questions that people want to make? Um, love to, yeah, please, yeah. Let's, let's pass. Thank you. In the beginning, um, after the Exclusion Act was um, rescinded, you had to have a relationship to sponsor someone to first come, right? Is that still in effect, or is it just the quota system? Well, there's, there's, um, there's, different, um, there's different quotas, so that if you were uh, one of the um, preferred professions uh, or had a certain amount of money, then you could uh, come in under those, uh, under those quotas. Uh, but then there's also the family reunification. Um, that was another subquota, and that was really then enabling people who had family members here to then apply for family members to join them. And that's how a lot of people have come over. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so those quotas still exist, and in some ways those quotas, um, it, it really means um, that the exclusion laws have never entirely gone away. It's really a quota system. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and we know, um, you know, from recent number of years that the, those quotas oftentimes get shut down or certain countries get villainized and then it's very hard for people from those countries to come over. Uh, it is really the Chinese exclusion laws that, that um, set that precedent. And as I mentioned, I mean, I've done some research on eugenics and the 1924 immigration laws really are really instigated by the eugenicists. So people who come from Jewish backgrounds or quote unquote um, uh, Mediterranean backgrounds, uh, you know, uh, Italian backgrounds, the immigration numbers dropped off the cliff, basically 1924, because they were set, the numbers were set at 2% of the 1890 numbers. So um, basically most Americans don't realize that the 1924 immigration law was a eugenics immigration law that was trying to keep out the inferior Europeans from coming into this country. Um, so it, it's really quite dramatic. So if you look back at your own family's history, you may see some patterns there in terms of who could come over when and when they could not come over anymore. And um, you know, it was really the American eugenicists who really set the stage um, for, um, in fact, um, kind of fascist policies. Um, the fascists and Nazis took it further um, but um, uh, Madison Grant, who came over, uh, his family came over, uh, Robert Treat, who was the quote unquote founder of Newark in, uh, uh, in 1666. He was a descendant of that family. Uh, Madison Grant wrote The Passing of the Great Race, um, which had a preface by Teddy Roosevelt and was really embraced by a lot of the um, Protestant elites in New York. Um, Hitler claimed that that book was his Bible, that, that his inspiration for furthering developing these policies were really um, coming out of the American context. So eugenics um, and a lot of the kind of racism and the policies uh, of this country that this country had um, were understood by other people in other countries as potential ways of uh, setting up um, laws, immigration exclusion laws, but also uh, internal domestic laws that would be not only segregation, but also take it further. Um, so part of what's difficult, I think, is that this story, this telling of, of, the, of the American story is different than the one that we tend to um, really be taught, and that's really manufactured in terms of how the dominant narratives are as a nation of immigrants that has welcomed immigrants. And we kind of know that's not true, but the underlying story of what happens to indigenous people, that the story that's gonna be revealed in the reinstallation of this, of this hall, um, of indigenous people, what happens to indigenous people and the dispossession of indigenous people, and then how enslaved people are brought, to, brought here as really part of the same economic system of political arithmetic. Uh, 
and then how the China trade and global trade really emerges from that. That's in some ways the foundational history of this country. And then immigrants coming in to work in factories, to work on land, to, um, to get land grants that was really indigenous land. All that story really comes after on top of um, the occupation um, that happens. So I just think it's really important for us to come to a more realistic understanding of that history. And it's something that's now being written about more and people are actually buying those books in a way that was not true 20, 30, 40 years ago. That just wasn't possible to have those stories. But it worries me that um, the reaction that's going on is also going to push back those kinds of uh, more open, frank um, understandings of, of what has happened uh, in this country as well. So, um, well, listen, I better wrap up. I'm sure I've gone over time. Uh, but thanks for uh, being with us tonight. And thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Really valuable to have your stories. And really, you're the one who should be up here talking about this story. So, <laughs> but um, thank you all for coming. Yeah.